G'day everyone, welcome to Lubrication Explained. In today's video, we're going to talk about the ASEA specs for light duty engine oils. So in the past, we have talked about API designations, so SP and SN, all that kind of stuff. This is the European version of that. So let's get into it. All right, so we're going to talk about ASEA light duty engine oil specs. There are a completely different set of specs for heavy duty applications. So here we're just talking about light duty. So think of passenger cars, you know, taxis, small trucks as well for delivery and distribution. As we start to get into heavy haulers, that's when you get into the E classifications. So we're not going to talk about that today. We'll, we'll do that later. The reason I wanted to address this is because there was a June 2021 update to the ASEA light duty engine oil specs. And so it's very relevant at the moment. And you might firstly be wondering who are ASEA? Like who are these guys that get to make all the rules? So ASEA is actually a, uh, it's, it's a trade body effectively that represents a whole bunch of European car manufacturers, or at least that's how it started. So here's the full list of uh, manufacturers that are represented. And the first thing you might notice when you look at it is, hold up, a lot of these guys are not European. So Honda, Hyundai, to Toyota, for example, uh, they're clearly uh, Asian manufacturers, either from Korea or from Japan. And that's absolutely true. So ASEA, over the last couple of years, has started to let in uh, manufacturers who have a large manufacturing presence in Europe. So Toyota and Hyundai and Honda, they all have large manufacturing facilities, a lot of them in Great Britain, but some of them in mainland EU as well. One thing I think will be interesting to see from here on is Tesla is obviously building a large facility in Berlin, so Giga Berlin. It'll be interesting to see whether they then join uh, ASEA because it is really a uh, representative body for all car manufacturers not just internal combustion engine manufacturers. So uh, that will be an interesting development over the next couple of years. And maybe Tesla will help uh, shape what electric mobility looks like in Europe. Obviously, a lot of these other players are getting into electric mobility as well. All right, so let's talk about all of the different uh, classification systems that we have. So I've shown this in the past, I think on the API S video or the ILSAC GF6 but we have a number of different classifications right so we have ILSAC and then we have the CJ CK classifications from API we've also got the Japanese versions with uh, JSO and ASEA which comes out of Europe and these are all engine oil specifications which sit alongside all the fuel specifications right which have to do with uh, emissions regulations so ASEA which I've highlighted in green kind of sits with the uh, Euro 4, Euro 5, Euro 6 classifications. And uh, I'm only showing this timeline up until 2017 because there hadn't been too many updates, but of course we've recently seen uh, GF6 being you know, formalized and of course uh, the ASEA 2021 classifications. If you remember when we talked about it in the past, we have kind of moved from an emissions control paradigm into what we might describe as being a fuel efficiency paradigm. So in the past, I had talked about the fact that everything was about engine oil specs was driving down emissions. And a lot of it had to do with uh, NOx, so uh, nitrogen compounds that were found in emissions. And once they got that down to a very low level, then the way that you can improve emissions is really by reducing the amount of carbon dioxide that comes out of the tailpipe. And that means you can have to rely on fuel efficiency because there's no other way of reducing uh, that carbon load. Now, when we talk about it in uh, the ASEA categories, there are sort of two different big classes. So the A, B categories are for uh, gasoline and diesel engine oils, which are what we call high uh, sulfated ash, phosphorus, and sulfur. Right? So that's what SAPS means. There's another category, which is the C category, and you can remember this easily because C for catalyst friendly. So it's catalyst and DPF compatible gasoline and diesel engine oils. And these generally have lower SAPs. 
Right, so that's the, the easiest way to distinguish between the two. And when you take a look at the actual specifications, these are uh, freely available online from the SEO website, by the way, and I'll put the link in the description. Um, when you look at these categories, you can start to see the evolution of them going from uh, controlling emissions to controlling fuel efficiency, and you can see the way that it affects the formulations. Now, one thing I will take note of is the fact that in the 2021 update, ASEA actually removed the A3B3 and the C1 designations, so they no longer exist for engine oils. So let's simplify this down to the ones that still exist. So your A3B4, A5B5, A7B7, and then C2 through till C6, which you can't see because my head blocks the view. Um, okay, now let's have a look at uh, these five parameters. So these have kind of all got to do with uh, the formulation, right? Uh, high temperature, high shear viscosity, ash levels, phosphorus, sulfur, and TBN, so total base number. And as you can see, um, remember that we're going, as we go to the right for the A designations, and then from C2 to C6, uh, these happen sequentially, right? Uh, so take a look at the TBN numbers, for example. On the light uh, duty non-catalyst, so high saps, uh, uh, engine oil classifications, we've gone from TBN of you know, greater than 10 to greater than 6. So that has reduced. The amount of ash that's allowable has reduced. But phosphorus and sulfur are not a huge concern because remember, we're not having to be compatible with catalysts and DPFs. And phosphorus and sulfur are known catalyst poisoners. So that's why when you go over to the C category, we define limits for phosphorus and sulfur and in general as you move to the right of the page those limits kind of uh, decrease except for in, in C4. So that's one thing to take note of. The other thing to take note of is the HTHS viscosity which is generally related to fuel efficiency. That has also slowly decreased over time. Now there are some other uh, things to, to, to make note of. So in the A7B7 category and the C6 category, which are new to 2021, the TBN test criteria is slightly different. Uh, so there are two different uh, uh, TBN tests as defined in the ASTM methods. Uh, the old one was 2896. I can't remember the new number. It's like 4739, I think. Uh, but basically, the you know they've reduced the allowable uh, TBN number but it is actually a different TBN test. So something just to make note of. Now, there are other engine tests which are applied in order to get your certification. And uh, these have to do more with things like uh, wear protection and fuel economy and things like that. So the, uh, the five up the top are related to the formulation and the five down the bottom are related to performance. And what you can see very clearly is the way that ASEA is kind of moving the needle on the requirements. And let's let's talk through the logic a little bit. So we've got valve train wear, fuel economy, a turbo deposit test, an LSPI test, and a chain wear test. And turbo deposits, LSPI, and chain wear are new to 2021. And you might recognize that from our ILSAC GF6 video because those tests are in some of the newer API designations as well. Right? So uh, let's and, and let's okay, so let's talk through the logic. As you reduce phosphor uh, sorry, phosphorus and sulfur, and as you reduce TBN and ash, how are the formulators going to respond to that? Well the easiest way to pull phosphorus and sulfur out of your formulation is to remove ZDDP or a similar anti-wear additive. Right? So that's how you reduce it in your formulation and that's to protect the catalyst. Well, what is the flow on effect of removing ZDDP? Well, I'm probably then going to be concerned with component wear because I've just removed the anti-wear part of the, the additive package. So to compensate for that, a SEA then has to introduce new tests to ensure that these are able to protect engine components even without the standard anti-wear pack, right? So 
that's the kind of logic that they're following for all of these new tests. Now, one thing that's interesting is that that's a lot of sort of technical information. ASEA actually does give sort of what they describe as consumer descriptions of all of the different categories. Um, and it's helpful to talk through these because it gives you a little bit of insight into how they are developing the categories. So A3B4, which is now, as it exists, the oldest uh, category that's you know still approved, it says stable staying grade engine oil intended for use of extended oil drains in passenger vehicles and light duty diesel and uh, gasoline engines, also suitable for applications described under A3B3. Now, the key term I think in there is extended oil drain interview intervals, which wasn't in the previous language for A3B3. Then when you move on to the next spec in this category, A5B5, all right, it is extended oil drain intervals, low viscosity engine oil, so they've started to reduce the uh, HTHS viscosity and they're doing that for fuel efficiency reasons. And finally, noting that not all of these oils are backward compatible, right? So it says it's un unsuitable for use in certain engines, right? Because we have maybe tinkered with the anti-wear package, we may not want to use these products in older engines. So again, consult the OEM manual. And then when you move one step further into A7B7, look at the language here, it's extended oil drains, it's low viscosity HTHS. We're now protecting against LSPI, right? Because that became a concern and I've done a, a video about LSPI as well. I'm concerned about turbocharger deposits and it is continues to be unsuitable for use in cert certain engines. So it's not necessarily backward compatible. So each time that they release a new ASEA ca category, they're trying to deal with um, changes in the formulations and whether that will have knock-on effects for engine performance. That also has to do with engine development as well. So if you'll remember in from our LSPI video, we said that LSPI is really a byproduct of small turbocharged engines. And as we increase kind of engine pressures and we, and we force more air through the system, what we have found is that LSPI becomes a concern and it seems like calcium-based detergents are a contributing factor. So again, in order to meet the A7B7 criteria, formulators are probably having to pull uh, calcium-based detergents out and include magnesium-based detergents or something similar. All right, so I hope that's been helpful in explaining the ASEA categories. Um, as usual, if you've got questions or comments, please leave them down below. Otherwise, this has been Lubrication Explained.